All right, we got a little under three minutes until we get things started. We've got C. Dobbleman already checking into the chat. We got Petty Bourgeois. What's going on, guys? Two and a half minutes, and then we're going to get things started for the week. There we go. We got SK in the YouTube chat. What's going on, guys? One minute, 45 seconds until we are going to get it going. All right, 30 more seconds until we get things going. We're already halfway to the 30 viewers for the HT giveaway, so making some good progress right there. Halfway there, and if we get up to that 30 number, we'll be giving away one of our HT branded Yeti tumblers. 15 seconds. And I know SK in the YouTube chat was a winner of one, and hopefully she got it, because I sent them all out a few weeks ago, so hopefully we have some confirmation that they were received for those who have previously won. Three seconds, two seconds, let's X out of this, and let's get things started for the week. Welcome back to the weekly, you know, stock market, option selling, scan, get together, you know, maybe therapy session tonight because it was just a rough week in the market last week, as evidenced by, you know, this pretty big dip that we have in our account performance. And to start things off, since this might be a little bit of a, uh, of a support group in here tonight, because I know it was rough for a lot of people last week, we want to take a look at the bigger picture. And I know if you're new to you know our style of trading, if you're new to following us, you may have jumped in for what is this little downturn in our performance. But, you know, it sucks. It definitely sucks to be losing money in 2022. However, it's all about the long run. We want to put together strategies that help us win in the long run. Uh, in the last 18 months of our trades being public, well, I think it's 20 plus months at this point of publicly tracking our trades, we're still up over 100%. We're still crushing NASDAQ. We're still crushing the S&P 500. And even though we're losing money this year, uh, if you take a look at our performance against NASDAQ and the S&P 500, if this tab comes up, there you go right there. We are right in the middle of NASDAQ and the S&P 500. So, even though we are losing money at the end of the day, what is our goal? Our goal is to outperform the market. And we could finish the entire year and lose money, but as long as the market loses more money on a percentage basis, we have done our job. And a lot of people don't like to hear that. A lot of people want to hear, oh, I'm going to turn $1,000 into $20,000 in a month. But that is not what we do. That's not smart investing. And that is not a strategy uh, trying to turn 1K into 20K. That's not a strategy that is going to help you in the long run. So with that said, let's take a look at the bloodbath. Transparency is very, very important. There it is. We, we threw away 15K, but we dropped about 9%. The market dropped 2.68%. Uh, and one really important thing that I kind of want to put up here is just how disgusting the slide was in the S&P 500. So we'll pull up SPY uh, to show you that S&P 500 ETF. 
because Tuesday afternoon, things are actually looking pretty good for us, right? You know, the market was up. Even Wednesday, the market was still up. But what we saw between Thursday morning and Friday afternoon uh, when the market closed is quite honestly one of the crazier two-day slides uh, that I've seen in my experience trading. And you might say, HT, well, what about like the COVID crash? Yes, that was a more severe dip. But in the COVID crash, you know, it was gapping down. There were bounces that open. It was all over the place. What we've seen over these last two days with just a complete lack of green candles, just a brutal, brutal sell-off. It looked like we were about to rebound at the end of the day on Friday, and it gave away five more points. It was insane uh, what we were seeing right there. Uh, but with that in mind, you know, we have strategies that can help us manage these, but when we see skids like this over a 48-hour period, it's going to be tough to manage, and that is what we saw right here. It's going to be tough to make money. But that's all right, you know. Roblox, we lost a decent bit of cash on. Netflix, Affirm, DraftKings, Fuba, they were all sliding on us. I think Palantir was really our closest one of the core plays to making money. It only lost 500 bucks. But with Snap and Carvana, those went well. We recouped a little bit. But at the end of the day, it is what it is. Not going to be worth spending too much time talking about every little thing in here and saying, okay, this went down, this is what happened, this went down, this is what happened. What's important is knowing, okay, we lost 15 grand last week. Our account took like a 9% haircut. What are we going to do from this point forward to help recover that? So let's talk about what we're going to do. And I think the most important thing that we've done for the upcoming week is we've put ourselves in a situation where we, we've seen the market drop really, really sharply over the last 48 hours. When that typically happens, you know, it's never usually a straight line to the bottom. We could emphasize that by maybe going to the 180-day chart on the S&P 5, <laughs> 500, and there you go. These, this is two days of action right here, and if you look over the last 180 days, I know we've had some big drops over the last 180 days in the market. Uh, I don't think we've seen anything like this. Even just one of these candles is pretty significant. To have you know two of these over a two-day period is nuts, but I've made my point on that. Uh, but the point is, when the market runs down like this, what is our favorite little indicator on a 180-day basis? We love RSI. We love looking at when things are oversold. And it is back down into the blue as of market close on Friday at a reading of 22, which I think is about the lowest save for last September when things initially turned back down a little bit. Uh, but this is one of the lowest RSI readings we've had in a while. Why do we love RSI, especially on a broader market basis? Here is the answer, because every time this thing gets down into the blue, we typically see some short-term relief. Uh, those of you who trade with us know we love to look at RSI. Uh, even when we had this initial drop, I think when the Russia-Ukraine conflict was getting started and there was a lot of fear surrounding all that, uh, and it dropped down to 410, RSI was down at 20. That's right around the reading that it's currently at right now, and we got a very, very sharp bounce off of that. And that's not to say that things are going to run back up to 450, 460, and we're going to be good and be in a you know 10-year bull market after this. But I think it is to say it's not illogical to expect a little bit of short-term relief. And yes, we can get crushed a little bit on the way down, but when things bounce back up, we want to be able to capture it. So what does that mean? It means not really rolling our strikes too far down as to cap the gains that we could potentially receive in a week. Uh, and for some of the trades, like Palantir, like DraftKings, like Fubo, uh, we kept our shares and we kept them uncovered in anticipation of some sort of a bounce early next or early this week, I guess. It's already Sunday. However, with futures at minus 0.65%, it looks like we may not get that. But, uh, you know, it's only 9 o'clock Eastern right now. There's plenty of time between now and when the market opens tomorrow morning and even more time between the end of the week on Friday. We've seen, you know, what can happen in two days. So uh, between right now and Friday on close, I'm not too concerned about what we see in futures right this second. The only thing that may be kind of applicable to that are these S&P 500 bullish put spreads that we sold uh, on Friday as a little bit of a revenge trade because we were upset about the fact that the market was just relentlessly dropping on us. It's super frustrating when that happens. Uh, and we said, okay, I really believe that things are going to bounce. And the reason that these are a little bit more applicable for this coming week is the fact that you know these expire on April the 26th as opposed to next Friday uh, the 29th. So why did we choose the 26th? And this goes to a conversation that we're going to have a little bit later in the stream about earnings. 
But if I pull our Discord server over here really quickly, I posted a schedule of the upcoming earnings. We always try to post that every single week. And if this thing loads, I could quickly try to scroll down. Here we go. Earnings plays. And we got some really good charts that I'm going to talk about a little bit later in the stream. But this is kind of why the strike that we picked for our SPX a bullish put spreads is significant. Now, recently with SPX, there's all sorts of great things about SPX. It's a tax advantaged asset. It trades in, you know, kind of larger lots. So you, I guess, larger price value since it's an index. So you don't need to sell as many contracts. So you save a little bit from a commission perspective. Uh, but I like trading it as, you know, anytime I want to trade the S&P 500 index, the SPX uh, index is the way to do it. So what this trade is, in plain English, if we just type in SPX, we could pull up the actual numbers because it does deviate slightly from SPY. It's not like one to one. But what this trade says, since we shorted the uh, we shorted the 42.20 and bought the 42.10 put behind it to create that bullish put credit spread, meaning that if SPX finishes above 42.20, both of these will expire worthless. We will receive the credit between the, that is the difference between the credit we received for selling the 42.20 and the debit we paid to buy the 42.10 behind it. That was 2.10. Plain English, if SPX finishes above 42.20, this will hit max profit. Where is 42.20 on this chart? It is right here. So basically, we have placed a bet, if this line will draw for me. That's close enough. Let's get this line out of here. We have placed a bet that the S&P 500 index, SPX, is going to finish above this red line by end of market on Tuesday. So 4 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday, it needs to finish above this red line. Why do we love these trades? One, you know, we see RSI is at a, you know, historically, not historically like all time low, but historically lower than it typically has been since, uh, you know, end of February, which is relatively significant. So we anticipate a little bit of a bounce. But why do we like to sell these out of the money put credit spreads? Because look, if we're wrong, which we may be on Monday, it might drop a little bit more before it bounces. Uh, we want to be sure uh, that we can still make profit if we're a little bit wrong. So if it drops a bit, you know, and gets close to this red line, we could be wrong about the bounce and still make money on the spreads. And that's what we really like. And that is the idea with that. And again, we kept this a little bit smaller. I say it's a bit of a revenge trade because we opened, typically these are $5 wide. Since this is $10 wide, this is the equivalent of opening six of the $5 wide spreads. If that doesn't make sense to you, because I realize a lot of the things I say may not exactly make sense right off the bat. But uh, feel free to ask for some clarification in the comments. But it's 10 wide, meaning it's technically a double size position. So you would want to sell half of the normal contracts. I think me going full tilt on SPX, if this thing kept crashing through and broke below 4,200, uh, I would look down to this 4,150 level and then maybe open six of those as well. Because like at the end of the day, we're not sitting at a roulette table. If the market goes down a few days in a row, it is more likely to come back up. These aren't a series of independent events. Uh, the concept of mean reversion is a very, very real concept in the market. So that's what we're going to play. And that's our view of the market right now from an overall, you know, S&P 500 broad market perspective. Uh, and that directed one of the trades that we have for the upcoming week that will make 630 bucks for us at max profit if it holds that price level that we just outlined. And here, the way that we always want to evaluate the positions that we're in for the coming week is if the market doesn't move at all, right, if the stocks that we're in stay at the exact price that they were at on uh, on last Friday at market close, how much money are we going to make? And this is the answer. If these don't move at all, because it's, it's tough to evaluate, you know, where uh, stocks may go, right? They could go up, they could go down. If they go up, we're going to make a lot more than this. If they go down, we're going to make less than this. But, you know, typically from a more conservative, more realistic view of projected price, uh, projected profit for a week, this is how we like to look at it. We like to look at it if these stocks didn't move at all. And we have these stock prices over here. These option prices reflect, uh, and the stock prices reflect what the value would be Friday at close if we saw these stock prices. So dead flat, we make 2.5% back. And, you know, baby steps, right? I think that's decent. And what's great about this is typically when we go into a week, you know, maybe this would be our max profit because we sold everything out of the money. 
But since we saw this big dip last week, we want to play a little bit of a rebound. So what I really like about the positions that we have set up for the coming week is that if we do see that rebound, these positions give us a chance to catch it. Notably, Palantir, DraftKings, Fubo, we did not sell covered calls on these yet because we want to have a little bit of upside. I mean, DraftKings, I think, is one of the biggest offenders. <clears throat> Excuse me. If we pull these charts up, I mean, RSI is getting back down into the gutter again. I mean, just over the last 180 days, this is one of the most depressing charts I think I've ever seen, going from 64 down to 1395. That is nuts, even on a 20-day perspective, just the last trading month. This thing's basically been cut in half. Now, they report next week, not this week, but next week. So we have basically one week to sell options uh, before we have to worry about any of that inflated earnings premium or potential earnings-based moves. Uh, but I'm definitely anticipating a bit of a bounce because it went from 17 to 14 uh, in just three trading days, which is a crazy move over three trading days. And it was at 21 uh, back at the beginning of April. So if we just have a little bit of a bounce back to, you know, 15 or 16 next week, which I don't think is something unreasonable to potentially plan for, uh, I don't want to cap my potential gains uh, at any of these strikes yet. Now, what is interesting is, you know, if we did want to play a little bit more conservatively, uh, we could sell options on these, right? The 12.5, excuse me, DraftKings, the 15 strike calls, we're going for 35 cents. I've got that in my notes as of market close on Friday. So basically, if we did want to take the safe route and sell these, you know, we could sell 35 cents of premium there. Fubo six strike calls were selling for 15, uh, so we could have done that there. The Palantir 12.5 strike calls were selling for 0.26, so we could do that there as well. And, and between the three of those, the Palantir calls, the DraftKings, and the Fubo calls, that's 1,800 more dollars of profit. So if we did want to take a little bit safer of an approach, you know, we could give ourselves 1,800 dollars for free right now that we would get no matter what. Now, what is the catch? The catch is that we couldn't make more on these shares than 1250. We couldn't make more on these shares than 15. And we couldn't make more on these shares uh, than if it were at, uh, I think, not six strike, but the five strike. That was a little typo on my behalf right there. Uh, but if that's the route you want to take, I would never tell you that you are wrong for taking that approach because we like to sell option premium. We want to protect ourselves further on the downside. This is how you accomplish that. Uh, but I think there are times to get a little bit aggressive in the market. And when you see that the market has dropped 2.68% last week, 2.17% the week before that, and 1.18% the week before that, you know, when are we going to get a little bit of green? And one of the approach, the, I guess the approach that I made kind of at the beginning of April was to take a little bit of this volatility that we saw in our account off of the table. Because we would have these, you know, big losing weeks. And honestly, we did terribly in January. We got over leveraged in a couple positions. We lost money, but we learned some good lessons. So moving forward, we will not be making the same mistakes. But that's just part of the reality of trading. Some of that stuff just happens. But how are we going to get it back, right? We saw these crazy swings where we would lose. I mean, after the first three weeks, we were down like 40k. But in the next three weeks, we made back what 21, these three are $22,000. So we were kind of getting our head back to water level. And uh, then we lost $20,000 the week after it. But the week after that, we made 17000 back. And we're like, okay, we're right back in the game. And then after that, we lost twenty two in the next two weeks. And we said, okay, this sucks again. Let's try to catch a bounce. We caught a bounce. We made $29,000 the next three weeks. And that's when we said, okay, we're going to size our positions down. This little whipsaw we saw at the beginning of 2022 was insane. It made our head spin. It you know, gave me a little bit of anxiety, honestly, when I'm trading, which is a feeling that I hadn't had in a decent amount of time. I think uh, from a psychological perspective, you want to be detached from your money. Now, you don't want to be so detached that you don't care if you're risking everything, uh, but you want to make decisions that are objectively the best for your money. You don't want to be risking losing 20% in a week. And I felt that that was kind of the road we were getting on, right, with some of these bigger swings. So I said, okay, you know, we're still kind of in line with NASDAQ and the S&P 500. Let's chop the positions down. And what I can say is that this is the projected profit for next week. So ignore this little rebound. But where we're at right now is significantly higher than where we were at off the first dip at the beginning of March. And we could look at that first dip in the beginning of March, uh, I guess, let me go to the 180 day here. That first dip in the beginning of March, 
saw DraftKings go down to about $15 a share, which is insane. It was insane at the time because we had just been trading it at 24 and it went down there in like 10 days. So at the bottom, DraftKings was at 15. Now it's even worse than that. Let's look at Palantir. At the bottom, it was at 9.4. That one at least has recovered a little bit. So we've done okay with that one. But let's look at Fubo. Fubo, at the bottom of that March dip, was at like $6. Now it's at $4.59. It's worse than that. Let's look at Roblox. Marvin in the YouTube chat, what's going on? Roblox, at the bottom of the dip, was at $34.69. It's now below that. So the idea that I'm trying to get at right here is that all these stocks that caused the big dip in our account down to here at the beginning of March, uh, when we thought that was crazy, those stocks are even lower now, but our account is doing better relatively. So that is something that we take away definitely as a positive, and that's a result of us cutting down our position sizes to try to absorb a little bit of the uh, little bit of the drop. Because I can guarantee you, if we had our original position sizes for this past week, this number would have been disgustingly bad. But if we look back to 2022, right, we'll have a couple bad weeks in a row, and then we'll catch a great bounce. The idea was that we want to limit our position sizes because inevitably the market's going to go up, it's going to go down. So when it does go down, we want smaller position size, reduced losses. So again, mission accomplished in that regard, right? A lot of the stocks we're playing are even lower than they were at this point, but we've reduced the, the, the pain from the initial drop. And we're hoping that from here, you know, we catch a subsequent bounce. And it's not just 2022, right, where you see these down weeks really solid bounce down weeks really solid bounce right because if we catch another 23k bounce we are going to be profitable over the last two weeks we'll be profitable in april really really decently uh but you know we have to catch a decent bounce uh, but it's not just 2022 that we base that idea off of right if you go to 2021 the year-to-date summary when we would have these big red dips we would recover it pretty quickly afterwards that's just typically how this strategy is structured we're never individually going to have a 15K week, but we have those 15K weeks in response to the down weeks because our strategy involves kind of averaging our break-even prices down, progressively loading our positions larger, uh, lowering the break-even prices, and then we try to catch the bounces. Uh, so you see that a lot, right? You see that we had like an $11,000 loss last November, then immediately made nine grand the week after. We had this 15K loss, then we made 16K two weeks after that. We lost you know, 16K over a two-week period, made 15K right after that. It's a pretty consistent pattern, and it's one that has continued uh, into 2022 a little bit, albeit we didn't catch as big of a bounce off January because, honestly, some of these moves we've seen in the market have just been relentlessly negative and very, very tough to manage. I mean, look at Roblox. Uh, from 140 at the peak down to 34. Look at Affirm. Affirm has gone from 176 at the peak, bottomed out at 25, but is now back down at 30. I mean, some of these stocks that we have seen, some of these stocks we've been playing, you could look at Fubo, add that one to the list with DraftKings. I mean, it went from 35 down to 450. Uh, these are kind of dot-com crash-esque drops. So a lot of people ask, you know, what happens if you experience a stock market crash with this strategy? And with the stocks we've been playing between Roblox, Affirm, Fubo, DraftKings, Palantir, we've kind of simulated that. And the answer is, is this is what it looks like. We're still in line with the overall indices, and we know what happens when the market goes up and there's not a lot of turbulence. Uh, you know, our performance, uh, where's the tab, where's the right tab? Our performance looks like this. We crush the S&P 500 because we use a little bit of leverage. And we know that if we look historically, since we've been publicly tracking our trades, we're still crushing those indices. So that's kind of the plan, right? We want to weather the storm when it gets really, really rocky because we know that when the market turns around, and it's not the market's not going to go down forever, uh, but we know that when the market turns around, we are well positioned to take some profit in. So let's talk a little bit about potentially catching that bounce as we have kind of been alluding to during this stream so far, if I could get my mouse back here. So what would happen if we did catch that bounce? And we're going to play with the stock prices over here because I think, yeah, they should all be tied let me make sure. Yeah, these formulas are all tied to the prices we see in column P over here. So again, let's use that idea of trying to forecast if we did catch that bounce, what some of these things would look like. So if Palantir got a bounce up to like 12.5, which again, is not even close to where it was above 13 last week. So these aren't unreasonable bounces. Uh, if a firm bounces back up to like 35, and again, a firm last week, 
a f r m a firm last week was at 37 so a 35 bounce would just be back up to this level again not an insane bounce from a price perspective on these stocks uh, if a firm bounced back up to what did I got? 35 right there. If Roblox, Roblox was trading at 42, I think, at the peak last week. Uh, if that thing bounced just back up to 38, if DraftKings goes back up to 15, we just get a dollar back. Fubo goes to 5. If Netflix goes to 225, we get bounces across the board. Uh, if SoFi maybe makes it back up to, you know, 675. And again, these hypothetical bounces are all lower than what it was trading at last week. But again, if that happens, all of a sudden, we have erased last week's losses just off of those bounces. Uh, and that's not, let's see what else we got here. That would get better. This would get better. Uh, I mean, that is how we rebound, right? So we average these prices down. We increase position when we can. Uh, and then we try to catch these rebounds. And these aren't huge rebounds. But the profit and from a profit and loss perspective, it, it goes a long way. And let's maybe talk a little bit about the positions we have heading into the week and how we ended up with every single one because we didn't spend a lot of time recapping last week. Palantir, we've had this one. We've been riding on this one. Uh, we're holding off on selling the calls for a bounce. There's not too much to say about that. Uh, UPS, the 155 strike puts that we have for June. Uh, there we go. We have a good comment from Rohit. I did mess this up. This is supposed to be dot, 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 429, and these are... I believe seven strike puts or maybe six, let me think they were seven strike puts that we rolled down to uh, the formula is inclusive of that it's calculating that seven but that is a good point that we are not including I forgot to include ALVR and CVM in here so these need to be added uh, but those will be updated thank you for keeping me honest I will update that after we uh, after we finish the stream but again those are two more stocks that could potentially bounce and give us a little bit more money. Uh, now, Affirm, this is one where we cut the position in half like a couple weeks, a few weeks ago. We we were rolling with five contracts here. And if you go back to some of the weeks where we took some serious pain, we had 15 Affirm contracts. And that is, you know, 15 Affirm contracts and 15 Roblox contracts as well. So keep that in mind for when we talk about Roblox. But 15 is what we considered the full position size for these stocks. And that's what caused us a lot of pain on the way down. So we said, okay, you know, these stocks have fallen a ton and I want to keep playing them, but I want to avoid the minus 20K week. Uh, so we cut it down to just five contracts. And from there, we said, okay, we'll sell 36.5 strike puts. Those were a little bit out of the money when we sold them last week. There they are right there. Again, they ended up being losers and we added some 32.5 strike puts and it kept dropping. I mean, a firm went from above 40 down to 30 in a week. It was in an... I mean, an insane little five-day move that we saw from a firm. But it happens. That's part of the market. These stocks can be volatile. We just need to make sure that our strategy allows us to hang in there because the last time we saw a firm drop, you know, seemingly hopelessly like this, let me see, 180-day chart. I mean, it, it went all the way from, please load, 176 to 25. And then from March 15th uh, to March 30th, a 15-day period, it rebounded from 25 up to 50. It doubled in price. So we just have to make sure we can hang in there with strikes in this level so we can, you know, it's going to go up, it's going to go down. Can it keep going down in the future? Absolutely. That's just, quite frankly, how the stock market works. We just make, need to make sure we have positions that allow us to kind of weather the storm. And that's kind of what we have right here. We, our our break-even price on a firm for the week, because we kept that original position, the 36.5 strike put, right? That's what we initially sold. And what that does is if a firm rebounds to 36.5, at any point or by the end of the week, we'll hit max profit on those, which is going to be $3,000, which more than covers uh, the 1800 we lost on them last week. And in addition to that, we're going to get $918 off the 32.5 strike push that we rolled. Uh, those lost us 351 last week. So again, off these top two right here, we're making back 4000 bucks after losing uh, 2100 bucks off that. So that's a net $1,900 recovery. And if you look, again, we could look at this from a 10-day perspective. This thing went from, you know, 40 down to 30. But as long as it just bounces back up to here, we are going to make money despite that 40 to 36 drop. And that is why we like to sell options because the stock can go down and we could still make money. On a 10-day perspective, the stock would be red, but we would still make $1,900 as we just outlined on a net basis right there. And then the cherry on top right here is we 
up to that to an eight position size because we talked about how 15 was a full position size. And we said, okay, you know, these are the times. Why did I take that position down to five? Because I wanted to be wary of the drop. We got the drop. Could it drop more? Absolutely. Every single stock on planet Earth can drop more, but that's just one of the risks that you carry uh, as an investor, right? So we wanted to be wary of that. But RSI, again, is down in the gutter on a, let me see, probably a 20-day basis. Yeah, it's back down near the 30s. It's dropped from 50 uh, down to 30 and started to bounce a little bit at the end of the day on Friday, which is nice, nice little assist. But again, we just need a little bounce back up to this level, and we've made a couple thousand bucks on a firm. So that's what we're going for right there. And we sold 28.5 strike puts to give us an additional $700 of profit. So on a weekly basis, if a firm got back to 36.5, we'd make $4,600 uh, after losing 2100 on it last week. So if you hold down control, we select all these. If a firm bounces back to 36.5, We'll have made a net $2,500, which is nice. Um, I'm a big fan of that. And the good part about this is this secondary position we've opened, the seven contracts, 28.5 strike. These individually have a break-even price of 27.5. So you might say, oh, you know, HT is a little bit dangerous to keep averaging down. And I'd 100% agree with you. It is risky to average down a little bit when you do. But on that piece that we average down, I think individually it's a very nice trade because it carries a break-even price right here. And I think that works out very, very nicely about uh, with, with protecting us from a future drop. And Affirm, they have earnings May 12th. So we have a couple weeks to continue to sell options on these before, again, we have to navigate uh, that inflated premium environment uh, that earnings typically bring. So we're going to play this one for a couple more weeks. We're going to see where it ends up. Hopefully, overall earnings in the market next week uh, go well. And then there's a little bit more confidence uh, but right now, money is flying out of the market. It's going to find a bottom at some point. We don't know. We just got to hang in there. Uh, but let's put that affirm price back to what it would be if it finished where it was on Friday at market close. And we know just from that, that's still on a weekly basis, $1,600 of profit if a firm just stays dead flat. We lost $2,100. So it would be a net $500 loss for us if it just stayed here, right? So we could have endured this dip with just a $500 loss off a relatively large position size, just as long as it stays here. And again, we do that same thing the next week, and we maybe make back 1500 more, and we're in a situation where, okay, a firm has run from 50 down to 30 over the last 20 days, yet we've made money on the stock. Uh, and that's why we do what we do, and that's, you know, because this allows us to trade these volatile markets, trade, uh, you know, really, really big cushions on things that we're entering into. Very, very similar idea with the next one on the list with Roblox, right? We sold 41 strike puts. We unfortunately rolled those last Thursday afternoon. So what we're showing on that initial one for next week is a little bit of a loss because on Friday, it dipped even further, unfortunately. Uh, but what we did last week was really, really similar. You know how we added the three uh, the three contracts on a firm uh, when it got lower? We added our additional seven on Roblox when it dipped lower. And we did that by selling some 35 strike puts on Thursday which I thought was going to go better than it did. Uh, for, or Roblox kept dropping, but despite that, these actually individually made us 49 bucks, which is whatever, right? I mean, doesn't really move the needle in the scheme of things, but the fact that it just gives you some context to the idea of how safe averaging in on these big, big red days can be and how big of a cushion you can afford yourself here. Because when Roblox was you know, shit in the bed and the entire market was dipping, we said, okay, we'll sell 35 strike puts on Thursday. And it, the Roblox kept going further down, yet that additional position, that additional risk we took on didn't lose any more money for us. It actually made us a tiny bit. So what we did, you know, really similar idea to how we just rolled a firm forward. Uh, we rolled these exact same strikes forward for Roblox so that if it, Roblox bounces back up and, you know, Roblox has gone from 52 to 34, very, very similar drop from a, uh, uh, very similar drop as a firm. And what I really like about the Roblox price point right here on the 180 day, it's lining up very nicely with this initial bottom that it made back in uh, back in mid-March. So it bounced off this 35 range once. I think if we see a little bit of momentum in the market, a couple of very big gaps from these candles to fill, I don't think 40 is an unreasonable target to, uh, to or an unreasonable price to target for a rebound. And again, if Roblox goes up to 40, what does that get us on Roblox? That gets us $5,200 from Roblox. And Roblox was one of our big losers last week, right? It lost us $3,400. But 
again, if it bounces back up, what do we, and I think maybe a good way to look at this is, yeah, it lost us 3,400 bucks last week. What would it take to make 3,400 this week? Would it be 38? Uh, no, we'd make more. That's 3,600. It's very, very close. I think maybe 37, if I'm just guessing, 0.8-ish. Uh, where's Roblox? Yeah, that's 3,400 bucks. Of, that's 3,500 bucks of profit right there. So we're in a position where Roblox has dropped, again, over the last 20 days, if we zoom this thing back out, it's dropped from 52 to 34. But if we just get a slight bounce uh, from where it finished Friday at 34.14 up to this break-even price, so to speak, of 37.8, which is right here on the chart, if we just get a bounce to here, uh, all of a sudden, we've made money on Roblox over the last two weeks despite this disgusting move down. And if you really wanted to get technical and go a few weeks, you know, two weeks back and look at what happened with the Roblox, we made 824 off of Roblox 41 strike puts. Uh, the week before that, we made 544 bucks off the 43 strike puts. And then the week before that, we made 728 off the 44 strike puts. So we've, you know, we had $2,000 of profit in the three weeks preceding uh, the big drop. And that was part of the big drop, right? This, this peak in Roblox, yeah, I'm already getting tongue tied. We're only 38 minutes in. But this, uh, this peak in Roblox price coincides, right? This is the week of 327. This is the week of 327 right here. So we have managed this slide profitable overall, right? If we want to look at our profit from what we're seeing on this chart on Roblox trades, uh, we could select th that trade, this trade, this trade, make sure we select our losers from last week. Uh, and then that alone is only a $1,300 loss. So what would it take for us to get a $1,300 gain on Roblox this week? The answer uh, is 35. So looking at this 20 day chart, if Roblox finishes at 35 this Friday, we could have endured a 20 day stretch where Roblox has gone from 52 to 35 and still made money on Roblox. And that is why the strategy is so, so, so effective uh, and it's especially useful for navigating difficult markets like this one where you see a lot of up action, you see a lot of down action. Uh, the important thing is not to get frustrated when you see these huge rebounds that outpace the strikes that you sell. Like if Roblox bounces to 50, we're not going to be able to catch that because our put strike is sold to 41. But I'll objectively be happy uh, that those 41 strike puts made us a lot of money this week. You just can't get frustrated and keep rolling, rolling up because what goes up sometimes comes back down. But similarly, what goes down typically will have some sort of rebound and come back up a little bit. And those are kind of the principles we're trading on here. But again, let's put that Roblox price back to what it was on Friday, 34, 35. But again, if we get a 65 cent, just a 65 cent week from Roblox and it goes back up to 35, we'll have been profitable on it over the last month. Uh, next one is DraftKings. Uh, we can kind of look at DraftKings and Fubo as one and the same. They don't present earnings this week. I think they're two weeks from now. Uh, but we're really, really hoping to catch a bit of a bounce on these stocks and then sell covered calls. But if we wanted to take the conservative approach and sell what was available Friday uh, between Palantir, DraftKings, and Fubo, that's an additional $1,800 of premium for us, which would put our quote-unquote baseline return at uh, at 5000 bucks. So that's really nice right there. Uh, SPX, we talked about that one. Netflix, we just, we're just going to roll that one, the 230 strike put. We're going to roll it. If it gets back up to 230 good for us. Uh, but I think that one, there's still a decent amount of premium on puts that are out of the, or options out of the money. So we're going to benefit from being able to roll for a credit week after week after week. Uh, we sold the initial 230 strike puts for about $3 a pop, which would give you a 227 break even. And then we rolled for a roughly four credit, which gets the break even on this individual one down to about 220 with Netflix trading at 215. And again, I don't think that is a bad place to be. There's a lot of discussion about sentiment. This, I mean, you see the last two earnings they've had. They've been absolutely disgusting. From a 180-day perspective, uh, RSI on Netflix is hilarious. This is 17. We thought the SPX RSI of 22 was low. This is a whole nother ball game right here. Implied volatility is kind of at all-time highs. RSI is at kind of all-time lows. This is a fantastic candidate for a long-term cash secured put, and that's something we actually did with uh, with June right here. We actually sold some 170 strike puts. Uh, and you could do that still. There's definitely still some opportunity there where if you sold just one of these, right, and it would require taking fully cash secured assignment if that did happen in June. 
but this is one of those potential long-term cash secured put plays uh, that we like to trade if we have margin because your max profit here is 390 if you get that fill and typically where it take like sixteen thousand dollars to sell this fully cash secured it would only take seventeen hundred dollars of collateral uh, to sell those so that ends up coming to like a 25 ish 30 ish percent return on your capital in a two-month period just provided that Netflix stays above 170. And if Netflix goes down to 170, you are going to have it at a historically incredible price. You are going to have Netflix at a price lower than anyone who has bought it, I think, in the last five years. So that's what we got right there. And I think we are a little bit optimistic, at least in the short term here, because off this first big earnings candle, yeah, you typically got the quote unquote, they like to call it the three day rule after earnings, where if there's a really bad earnings, typically for the next three days, it's going to keep going down. And you know, we've seen that play out a little bit. So it might be something to keep in mind a little bit as we try to scalp some of these poor earnings drops. Uh, but after that three day, it, it stabilized a little bit, rebounded a bit. Now, now the big spike from 400 to like 460 is off, you know, people saying, oh, this should be positioned for a buyout, yada, yada, yada. You know, Bill Ackman's taking a big stake in it. I don't expect anything like this per se, but uh, what I do expect is maybe something a little bit like this to rebound, you know, whereas back in the end of January, this thing, Bounce from 360-ish. We could zoom in here a little bit too. Uh, bounce from 360 up to like 400 before getting these huge candles that I don't expect to rely on. Uh, but right here, I don't think it's out of the question to maybe play a bounce back up to 230, which is exactly what we are doing right here, right? Big earnings candle, big candle down at open. We're playing it back down to where it opened uh, on whatever that April 20th. I think that was Wednesday. Uh, but again, if we look for precedent, we go back to here. These candles on the rebound before you got the big green candle on the buyout rumors, those got right back about to the bottom of that initial big candle. So that is the move I'm playing right now. I think it's you know definitely fine to keep doing that for the next couple of weeks or so until I can keep getting this 230 individually down. Uh, and if we do get out of that one profitably, yeah, then I'll probably take another spin and reevaluate if I want to keep playing it because I do have this June cash secured put, that little... That little trade that we just talked about, I think, plays out very, very nicely. So I've got one of those as well to help mitigate it a little bit. But that's something I'm just sticking with. Uh, Rite Aid, I think this is a great one because now we can get into the discussion of the IV reversion trades. And we had we made a little video last week about the IV reversion trades. If you have not seen that already, that's a full-length video on our YouTube channel. And we made a little TikTok uh, that generated some interest. So I, I don't know if we have some people here from that as well. But now we will talk about the IV reversion trades. And I'm happy to talk about these now because maybe a lone bright spot, although ALVR lost us a little chunk of cash last week. But again, that trade's not over. We'll evaluate those trades when they uh, you know, get to completion. ADGI, though, a couple weeks ago was our very first IV reversion loser of the year. We dropped a couple hundred bucks on that one, I believe. But, you know, it is what it is. You're not going to win every single trade. We're still very successful overall with that strategy on the year. And Rite Aid is another example of us trying to take advantage of one of those IV reversion setups. So let's go to the 10-day chart here. I think this is going to be the best way to illustrate it. And this is what we look for in an IV reversion trade, right? So we see that the stock is trading around, you know, 7-ish. We could call it maybe 750 because that's where this is. I guess maybe it's appropriate to call the range 7 to 750. Uh, and then you see they already had earnings, so there's one volatile event that's behind us. Uh, and then they're trading right around 7-ish after earnings, pop back up to 750. So we kind of considered, again, that 750 level to be, quote-unquote, the base. Uh, and then Wednesday afternoon, <clears throat> excuse me, you see this really, really big green candle. And again, that's kind of criteria number one that we outlined in that IV reversion trade video. Uh, criteria number one, big spike in price causing a big spike in implied volatility. Uh, and the spike in implied volatility was so large that implied volatility actually got back up to the levels that it was before the earnings announcement. And that is typically when implied volatility is the highest for a given stock. Uh, so that's what we were looking at right there. I mean, really not too bad. I mean, criteria number one has been met. Uh, criteria number two, I believe, was good news on the stock. Uh, and this big jump was off a rumor that I, I believe they were approached by a private equity firm uh, to be bought out for roughly 14 a share. So there was a huge bounce up to 10. Uh, and then it kind of fell back down at the end of the day. And why do we like to target this, you know, trading base, we like to call it? Because if it does come back down, and again, a lot of these do come back down, we want to 
have a decent idea of where it's going to settle back down a bit. And typically, that's right at the trading base. And that's exactly what we saw uh, as it fell back down around 750, was trading around 750 for a bit before breaching it and closing Friday at 736. But <laughs> getting to the point here, after talking about the price action on right it, what this does is create a very, very good opportunity for us to slide in and sell some options. And we were able to sell some seven strike puts. Uh, excuse me. We were able to sell some. Oh, I didn't even put them on because they, they broke even. But we sold some 7.5 strike puts for 17 cents. And what that means is we sold seven strike puts, meaning as long as it stays above 750, we're going to hit max profit. And when you're looking at a chart that looks like this, that looks like a fantastic deal. This is what we're looking at. This, these are the facts that we had uh, when we were making our trade. We saw that the stock was above nine a share. We said, okay, as long as over the next 48 hours, this thing stays above 750, that's max profit. That's 170 bucks. You know, that's cash. I'll take those odds every single day of the week. And we did take those odds, but it fell back down, fell back down, and right around that 750 level, that's why we, that's why we identify that trading base uh, before breaching it. And now, on Friday afternoon, we had a decision to make. I think this is a great one to talk about because it kind of gets into the discussion about, yeah, we have a super, super high win percentage on this strategy, but what do you do when it moves against you? I would consider this to a, to a slight degree moving against me. Uh, I could have either closed out for even money because I closed them for 17 cents, or I could have rolled them down and out for a credit. And when we have the opportunity to do that, we really like to do that. And why is that? Because when you roll for a credit, uh, the amount that you get from the credit is an increase uh, in your total overall potential max profit. And when we roll down from a 7.5 strike to a 7 strike, it reduces the price target for max profit on the trade. So instead of needing it to stay above here to make 170, we rolled for a 7 cent credit, meaning our max profit went from 170 to 240. And we rolled down from 7.5 to 7, meaning our target for max profit went from 750, if I remove this drawing, to 7. So now we're in a situation over the next five days where we have this company that just had buyout rumors. So there's you know some decent bullish catalyst in the near term future, uh, but we now have max profit above this point. Uh, and further, the overall credit that we have on this trade now is 24 cents. So while seven is our break even or our max profit point on the trade, 670, what was the credit again, 24? 676 is going to be our overall break-even price. So above here, max profit. Above here, make money. Below here, uh, we'll, we'll see what it looks like, and we can go from there and maybe do the same thing for next week. But this was an example of one where it was a really nice setup. We take advantage of that setup, moved against us, but because of what we did in the you know, evaluation of the trade on the front end, identifying that trading base uh, at roughly 750, we were able to have it fall back down and be in a situation where we can still make some money. Now, when we looked at the 20 day chart, it is a little scary because yeah, we saw 611. Maybe that could be a price that it falls back down to, but conversely, we also see 1030. So we're kind of in this range. I think it could be managed. There's really, really good option premium on it. So we just sit back and, and we see what happens. And that's kind of all you can ask for. So that was Rite Aid. And then BBBY, I think is a textbook iViewer version played that I'm super excited about that we were able to enter into at the end of the day on Friday and that was called out in our discord server by one of our bots so if you are watching right now not an HD premium member here is the little self promo that I'm going to give myself for 30 seconds before we get into this trade uh, if you go to hourglass-trader.com you can sign up for HD premium what do you get you get all these premium chat rooms yes we have all the free chat rooms it's always going to be free to learn the strategies because at the end of the day our goal when we started doing all this was to help steer people away from these terrible uh, you know, social media inspired YOLO type strategies where people are risking all their portfolio trying to make it big because that's just, it's going to do you more harm than good. You're effectively playing the lottery under the guise that, uh, you know, oh, I'm investing when it's just really irresponsible. So at the end of the day, we want to be able to teach people in the free channels. That's why these are here. But if you want to take your trading to the next level, get some more resources, uh, these are some great examples of some of these resources, right? At the end of the day, uh, here's Rite Aid, right? It popped up on that IV reversion alert scanner our stock halt alert scanner. Bed Bath & Beyond popped up for us at the end of the day. It tags you if you want to be tagged in those notifications. And if you are an HT Premium member and are saying, HT, how do I get tagged in these alerts? Go to the Premium Announcements channel. Uh, if you hit the stop sign, you will get alerts to the stop or the stock halt bot. And if you hit the diamond sign, uh, you will get alerts to the IV reversion bot as they are posted. 
Now, a lot of the trades that we enter into, you know, have relatively wide entry windows, but these two trades right here are a little bit more time, uh, time specific. So that's why we have the alert box. So, because I can't be glued to my computer every single day, of the every single day of the week, every single minute of the day. You guys are adults. You guys have things going on in your life. You can't be glued to your computer every single minute of the day. That's why we got these. These alerts come to your phone, no different. Uh, than a text message and alerts you to situations like what we saw with Rite Aid, where it fits that IV reversion criteria. It alerts you to trades like Bed Bath & Beyond, where there it is, there's that friendly green candle we'd like to look for, and let's talk about this Bed Bath & Beyond trade now. So another one with a very, very similar setup, right? You see that it's kind of taken a slide over the last 10 days, going from 20 to 16. Well, where do we think the trading base is here? Let's go back to the 180-day chart here. We could conceivably see a little bit of a base where it started to level out, uh, you see some bounces off the 15 level here back in the beginning of February. Uh, but we called 15-ish the trading base on this stock, especially over the last 10 days. That's where it started to level. I mean, 15's down here. 16 was really kind of the base it took off from. But when you back out to the 180-day view, that's where we kind of see 15 to 16 as the range. But again, what do you see here when we're looking for these IV reversion trades? You see the big jump in stock price big green candle and what does that cause a corresponding increase in uh implied volatility and again another one of these setups where we're already past earnings so there isn't this super binary volatile event in the future and another one where we see the bounce in stock price uh, elevate implied volatility above where it was pre-earnings which is a crazy crazy bounce and spike in implied volatility uh, so that is what we were looking at and what does that do? It allows us to slide back in like we did with Rite Aid, right under the tr right under the trading base, excuse me. And we were able to do that at the 15 strike. So what did we do? Uh, we sold some 15 strike puts on Bed Bath and Beyond, and we were able to get 27 cents of premium on those, which is kind of crazy. And if you go to Bed Bath and Beyond, you'll see April 29th. You will see the 15 strike puts, and this is probably going to be a great one. I'm kind of going live here. I don't know what we're going to see, but I think this should be a great one to look at the option price on because you're going to see this divergence between theoretical option price and actual option price. And this is what we love to see when we're targeting these IV reversion trades, right? Let's pop Bed Bath and Beyond the stock price up here. Let's go to the five day, five minute look, five day, five minute. And honestly, maybe the one day, one minute is probably a little bit better of a. Uh, better of a look here. So what you see on the one day, one minute chart, right, is this huge spike from Bed Bath & Beyond. Now, historically, I mean, this is a little bit inaccurate, this dip right here. Actually, excuse me, these are kind of on different bases, right? From here to here is an entire hour, but here is the remainder of the day. That's kind of strange. Uh, but what you'll see is that before the big spike, what were these 15 strike puts trading at? They were kind of bouncing around in the 30s. Yet after this big spike, right, because theoretically when options or when a stock goes up, the price of a put should go down. And that's what you see. Theoretically, the price of the stock went up. So the purple line, the theoretical option price, theoretically, it should have gone down. But that's not exactly what we see. In fact, at the time of the spike, we actually see a little bump in the price of these. And they remain relatively inflated around this 30 cent level, relatively stable around that 30 cent level. So what this means in a vacuum uh, is we took a stock that earlier in the day on Friday was trading around 16. It is now trading above 17. So the price is even higher, yet we're able to get this put at the same exact price. There is the advantage we get in these IV reversion type trades. Uh, and if we blow up the Bed Bath & Beyond chart and go back to the idea of what the IV is looking like, it's going to come back down, right? It, it, historically, if we go to the five-day chart here, this might be a little bit more telling. Post-earnings, implied volatility was chilling right around this one level. It spiked up to 1.5, back down to 1.2. But it, once the stock settles a little bit, it's probably going to settle back down to this one-ish level. And when it does, it's going to pull that premium down. And further, uh, even not looking at the implied volatility, just from a pure stock price perspective, our max profit point is anywhere above 15.5. So we have a very, very nice value proposition on this trade that we were able to enter into. You know, it spiked up. The price of these puts didn't change. So on a stock that went from 16 to 17 plus, we are now able to make max profit as long as it stays above 15. And that is why we like to do that. And the, that spike at the end of the day on Bed Bath & Beyond, what do we like to talk about earlier? Uh, it's 
we like these spikes that are caused by good news. And why is that in theory? Because when you have this trading base at 16 and a stock has good news, theoretically, it should be worth more than 16. So you can be confident, or confident and comfortable uh, that if it does fall back to 16 or 15, you know, you have it at a decent value. And there was good news because it jumped on a report of a possible buyout for, I think, part of their business. Uh, so that really kind of checked all of the boxes for what we looked for in an IV reversion trade. So really, really happy with how that one turned out. Loved the fact that we had a very timely alert in our Discord server, something we were able to act on at the end of a tough week. And what I love more than anything else about these IV reversion trades is that they are incredibly disconnected from the overall market. No matter how bad the market may you know, be, be working, uh, if the market crashes and Bed Bath & Beyond goes down 10% in a week, guess what? We're still going to hit max profit. It, it would take a very, very big move to take this south of the put that we sold. Can it happen? Absolutely. If it were impossible, there wouldn't be any premium on it. But we tend to believe with this strategy that the reason a lot of that premium exists is because of these implied volatility conditions. Uh, so that's kind of everything we've got. We rolled so, so far back down to seven strike just so we could potentially catch a little bit of a bounce. That's another one that if, if you look at the chart on SoFi, I mean, absolutely disgusting. Over the past month, if we put the 20 day on here, there's just no relief here. That is not too common, but it happens. This thing was up at 25 at one point. They had a bank charter. They've got decent, I mean, some I mean, a legitimate company. They, they dropped decently on bad guidance because student loan, uh, I think interest was paused. But if that comes back, not that, you know, no, no comment politically on whether or not that uh, is right or wrong. But from a stock analysis perspective, that would boost the stock. Uh, but just something to hang back on. Our, our average price is low sevens on this and where this thing's traded historically. Again, when the dust settles, I think it's a decent price to have the stock at. And that is kind of the core of all of our little investments and trades that we like to make. So we are an hour in. We've talked about what we have planned for the upcoming week. Uh, love the fact that we have a couple of these little IV reversion trades going. Uh, I'm super excited about potential bounces. It's discouraging to see minus 0.73 right now on futures. But again, a long time between now and, uh, and market open tomorrow morning. And even longer, as demonstrated last week, between now and market close on Friday. I think one good thing to put this in perspective, how quickly things can change. S&P 500 was at 450. It was up 2.5% on Thursday morning, and it finished down 2.7%. Uh, so seeing you know 0.75% of red doesn't scare me for how volatile this market has been. And again, we should welcome that volatility, provided that it's in both directions. So that's what we got for the week. And I think maybe the next thing to talk about and the final thing to talk about as we're hitting the hour mark here is upcoming earnings this week. A lot, a lot, a lot of interesting potential trades. We are in full swing for earnings. Uh, we've got UPS, General Electric, Microsoft, Meta, Boeing, Spotify, PayPal, you know, Twitter, Apple, Amazon, you name it. A lot of very, very big recognizable trades. What I also like about these earnings trades is relatively disconnected from the market as well. Yes, if Apple has a bad earnings, the market probably will not do well. But the cushions you could give yourself on these things... If there's just a general, you know, Fed-driven market sell-off next week again, the cushions you give yourself of earnings are relatively independent of those types of moves. So again, if we're in a very uncertain market, so I love the idea of playing things like IV reversion trades, earnings trades. So those are relatively disconnected from from overall market sell-offs. So here's what we got. We can maybe take a look at a few of these, right? Uh, we could take a look at, I don't know. Let's start with uh, Microsoft on Tuesday. Because that's one of the bigger names reporting. Let's go through the process that we like to go through. Microsoft, uh, you know, 15 plus or minus on the market maker move. I made a little sell on my profit tracker back in 2021 to make this a lot easier on us. We are going to type in the name of the stock right here, Microsoft. And then we're going to type in the expected move. So there's there's two metrics we look for. And those of you who follow along with us on a week-to-week -week basis, are gonna, you, you know what I'm about to say. Uh, but this is the market maker move, the MMM. This is Thinkorswim's, what they call a proprietary formula to calculate the expected range of move on a certain stock in the market. Then you'll have the more widely known, more widely used expected move, which is just the expected move based off of the way that the options are priced. And the way you calculate this is it's plus 18.98. The way you calculate this is if you basically add these up, it's the break even of an at the money straddle. So in theory, this should equal the uh, the combined premium on a put and a call 
at the money. So that is what that means. And how do we, okay, how do we make sense of these, right? Why are these numbers different? We technically should have an advantage in theory if this number is smaller than this number. And it typically is, but what we want to pay attention to is the magnitude by which uh, it differs. So what you have right here is a $3 difference, meaning thinkorswim thinks there's a smaller move than what the options think there's going to be. So what that means in theory is that the options are overpriced, meaning advantage for those who are selling them, because you're selling something that in theory is too expensive. Now, what do we like to do for ROR? We like to target 1%. If we can get more than that at a reasonable strike on a company that we're happy to take assignment on, I think that's something that we go for. But let's go through the process right here and decide if that's something that we want to do. Microsoft, 274.03 on close at Friday, 15.25 uh, MMM right here. So we'll type in 15.25 as the input on this little table. And it gives us a range of 258.78 to 289. So 258.78. 258 is right around here. 279 on the top end is right around here. Where are you, 278? Is that right? Is that in the middle of that? Did I read these numbers wrong? 258 to 289. That's 289. Excuse me. Remove drawing. Okay. So here, with these red lines, is what Thinkorswim believes is the expected move from Microsoft upon earnings. So from an option selling perspective, the idea is that if you sold options, if you sold calls above this line and sold puts below this line, you know, it should work a very high percent of the time. Now, as a lot of people have found out, especially on Netflix, you know, the losses are fewer than the wins in quantity. But as far as the dollar amount of the losses, they tend to outweigh the gains you make from the wins. So the one way that we really want to mitigate that risk is being comfortable with assignment. And maybe not assignment, but just comfortable continuing to play the stock, continuing to roll the puts, saying I'm very confident with Microsoft at this level. I think where you could get into a little bit of trouble is if you blindly take the approach of, okay, for every single earnings, I'm going to take the expected move. I'm going to sell calls above this. I'm going to sell puts below this. Whatever happens, happens. But I typically like to sell puts because the way you play defense, right? I mean, if you sell a, uh, a strangle and it, Microsoft goes to like 320 or something, you get blown out on the call side. There's not a lot of defense you could play right there. The reason I like to sell cash secured puts as a primary earnings trade is that I said, okay, if we go to Microsoft, we know that we like to target a 1% ROR return on risk, and we could scroll down to, you know, the 255 strike. That's where we get it. We see the 255 is below that red line. So the numbers kind of work out. And further, we're looking at the 180 day chart of Microsoft is 255 a price that I think would be good to own Microsoft at. And to be quite honest, I would tend to say yes here. I think it's at a very interesting point as it is kind of coinciding with this initial January dip, you know, that end of February, the March dips we talked about, it's kind of at that level. But the issue here is if it breaks down below this, where is it going to stop? And that's why we also like to use another little layer of analysis when we look at earnings trades to try to find a little bit of a support point on the chart. And we don't really see that here because right now on a 180 day basis, it's kind of at the low. The low technically is 269, but we know that I really want to look at it in terms of how does this red line here stack up to historical areas of support. So we're going to have to go to the one year. And there you go, you finally start to see it. The last time it was below 255 was in June uh, of last year, so last summer. And when it was there, you don't really see any support nor resistance. You see the lows in the last year are about 240, 240-ish. So we can maybe consider that to be you know, dramatic downside if it really does tank after earnings. Let's take a look at the three year. And this is where some of these larger tech stocks start to lose me a little bit because yeah, uh, we're looking at the 180 day chart, you might say, hell yeah, I mean, 255 is an awesome price to own the stock at this thing was at 350 uh, in November of last year. But look at the three year chart. Yes, you know, the economy grows, companies grow, you know, earnings grow. But there's nothing theoretically stopping it from even just coming back down to these pre COVID peaks of like 186. And if if Microsoft goes down to 186, and I've got shares at 255, that's a little bit of a problem for me. With other stocks, I think that's a legitimate line of reasoning. With Microsoft, I might say, okay, this is one of the stronger companies out there. If things do go south and you know the air starts to come out of the tires a little bit, 
255 is a good place for a starter position in the long run. And I, I think that's the line of reasoning that I tend to side with a little bit. And what's great about these is you could use a decent bit of margin. If you do use margin, though, be prepared to be able to take on that fully cash secured amount, right? Because selling one of these would take $25,000 uh, of collateral. And I might say, okay, if I had like a $250,000 account, I'd be perfectly fine allocating 10 of it to Microsoft if I were assigned. And that's a very, very safe way to play earnings. Uh, because again, if you look at it from like a buying power perspective, you're making like 300 bucks off $3,600 in collateral, meaning it comes out to like an eight or 9% return on capital uh, for what really is a two or three day play. And that is a very, very good value. And that's why we like earnings trades. That inflated premium allows us those types of opportunities. But in general, that's what the earning analysis looks like. I think 255 is a good strike. I mean, something I might consider myself if I wasn't so leveraged up in other positions. I want to be a little bit conservative in where I'm spending my money this week. Because look, if the market keeps dropping, as it may very well keep dropping because it's at minus 0.80 right now. But if the market does keep dropping, uh, I want to be sure that I can continue to manage these positions and not be underwater here before throwing money in other places. Because the way I look at it, as far as should I add positions, should I keep what I've got, uh, when you have enough positions like this going, it's it's kind of a win-win in a sense, where if the market goes up, perfect, you've made money. You might say, oh, I totally regret not throwing money in when it was down. But look, if the market goes up, you'll have made money. There's nothing to regret. That's a win. But if the market goes down, you might say, oh, wow, I'm, I'm glad I waited to throw my money in because now the market's even lower and I'm getting more advantageous strikes or you know, better premiums on what I was previously going to sell. So that is a win in itself. So a win-win in the sense that if the market goes up, we're winning. That's great. But also a win in the sense that, you know, if the market goes down, yeah, it sucks. It's a lose in the sense you'll be losing more money. But a win in the sense that that cash that you kept on the sidelines patiently to allocate during dips is now being allocated at better prices. So from, from my perspective, a lot of these trades, I think, are going to be more theoretical in nature. And, you know, a lot of the idea with what we do in here is to give you guys some, some options, you know, no pun intended, uh, some, some ideas to trade uh, yourself, right? Because my trades aren't going to be making money every single week. Hell, they're not making money this year. But we, we want there to be value beyond the trades I make. We want, even if you're losing money in a week, we want you to be able to take a step away and say, okay, this is what happened this week. I've learned from this and I'm going to be better for it going forward. Or even if something like that doesn't happen, say, okay, you know, I'm newer to this. I'm learning a lot about the strategy. Uh, I'm starting to grasp the concepts a little better and getting value about it that way. Uh, and then beyond that, everything in the Discord server, I want there to be value in, okay, you know, maybe we're losing money this week, but look, there's value in the fact that we're getting these call outs on things that might be disconnected from the market. We're getting call outs on stock calls here. We've got a you know chat room that's very, very active during the week. So there's more ideas and there's just a bunch of information to help me make the most educated uh, decisions I can. So even if we're losing money and the market's going down, I still want there to be that value. And, you know, I'm, I'm still getting either, you know, education. I'm still getting a lot of ideas. I'm still getting alerts and I'm still getting, you know, things that set me up to more, set me up to be a better trader, even if that week didn't go great for me, because bad weeks are going to be part of it. You know, it sucks when you may be starting out and just following us this year and it, it's been bad. And because one of the things I struggle with sometimes is, you know, when you're a guy who's posting trades and you know that there are people following the trades. Yes, it sucks when I lose money, but psychologically, I've lost money before. I've been trading for a long time. I can handle that. I do definitely feel a little bit of guilt to people who are newer and following along because in the back of my mind, I could say, okay, you know, I've been crushing it since we started this. I'm not too worried about a bad four months, but I do definitely feel some personal responsibility for those who started this year might be newer and are you know looking at this as their intro into this option selling strategy and getting the wrong idea about it because long term what we're really doing is just kind of tricking people into being long-term investors uh, but we're doing it in a way that allows us to have a little bit more control over our accounts act a little bit more like traders and you know derive hopefully better profits uh, on a week to week month to month and year to year basis uh, so that's what we're going for right here and going back to the earnings, you know, this is the process. Uh, you might say, okay, you know, HT, you talked about this on the stream and might say, you said you like this, why didn't you enter into it? You know, I could like a trade and just because of the situation I'm in in my portfolio right now, just it may not be smart for me to enter it, but it doesn't mean that it isn't a bad idea. So we're going to just try our best to continue to provide ideas like that. But let's keep moving through the list, right? Let's go back to that earnings graphic that we had. And a few charts, because we're coming up on an hour and a half. I may have to cut the stream off here soon, but... 
One thing that I think is very, very important to look at as we choose the next stock to look at is some of these charts that I shared in the uh, in the Discord server. Right in here, we've got Monday expected or expected move versus the average historic move. And one way to look at this is you you might say, okay, we got cooked on Netflix earnings last week. How can we potentially come back from that? Well, maybe let's target some options that are overvalued as opposed to maybe looking at things that are undervalued, like Activision. Well, we might look at Activision and say, you know, pull the chart up here and say, okay, you know, they have earnings this week. They've got an MMM of 373, which means that you could play cushion down to like 75-ish. You might say, okay, that's fantastic. I would love to go sell a 75 strike put or maybe a 77 strike put for 1%. But, you know, there's not a ton of value in that because historically the way Activision has moved uh, you know, it really, those options aren't fully pricing it in. I mean, it would almost suggest that it's better to buy uh, than to sell. So we want to be focusing on options on this side of it. Now, I did pull these off of Reddit. And, you know, as part of the move to automate more of the information and, you know, provide some more value to those of you in the Discord server, I think earnings are going to be the next type of bot that we try to build out where on Sunday night, it's going to give you an overview for the week of, you know, what this looks like heading into the week. And then on a daily basis, maybe say, hey, good morning. Uh, you know, these companies are presenting today. These are overvalued. You know, these are some strikes you could sell uh, and provide some value, uh, pro pro provide some value that way. So that's kind of the next project that we are, uh, that we're going for. But until then, this is what we've got. So CDNS cadence, I know that's a bank. Uh, this chart is suggesting that that earnings on Monday, that they're overvalued and it might be a good idea to sell those. So I forgot the ticker already because I try to read the chat off screen sometimes. Uh, and I stumble over my words when I try to talk and read at the same time, but CDNS. Cadence. Okay, it's suggesting that, you know, these are a little bit expensive compared to what the move should be. Now, what I don't like about this is these expire in 26 days. What I really like a lot of, about a lot of these earnings trades and in general, a lot of the higher implied volatility trades uh, are the quick turnaround time. So there's a very short time frame that things can move against you. So with cadence, I mean, we'll just keep going through the process because I, I do want to see how this chart right here translates to the process that we run through. So we know that it has a 979 and we could quickly throw it into here. So I can, one second. And I already forgot the ticker again, CDNS, CDNS. Uh, and appreciate the comment, Petty Bourgeois. You know, it's I definitely do feel some guilt when people lose and they follow me because it feels like it's my fault. But uh, to your point, there definitely is some value in, you know, kind of going through the school of hard knocks in a sense, uh, you know, when you're getting started trading. Because 2021 can create some very, very unrealistic expectations uh, for how the market typically is, right? We're not going to make 110% every single year. It's great that we did. And I think it's proof that our strategy has potential upside like that for when the market has a great year. But in reality, there's going to be ups, there's going to be downs, and you know, hopefully, maybe might be six months, it might be twelve months, it might be two years from now. But uh, I'm confident that if we just continue to stay disciplined with our position sizing and our strategy and our approach, what we're going through now will be something we'll look back on, hopefully laughing and say, look, you know, it can get tough, but it's nice to have fully recovered and get to a point where we're confident that you know, in the long run, things are going to be okay. But CDNS. Uh, back before I went on another little tangent right there, 979 MMM compared to a 17 uh, expected move. And what's really interesting here is that this concept of the difference between the MMM and the expected move is really reflected on this chart, right? Because the chart we were looking at says that these options are way too expensive. The options are saying there's going to be a 17 move. The MMM saying there's a 797 move. So the MMM is agreeing with the chart. So that's kind of in line that hits back on that idea of the difference between the MMM and the EM that we were talking about a little bit earlier on the stream. But let's plot this thing out. We know that the expected range for Cadence Bank uh, is going to be 132.82 to 163.32. So 132.82 to 132. Let's go to the 180-day chart here. I like that a little bit better. So 132. And the top end of the range is 163. 163. So from an upside perspective, I mean, the thing was at 193 back in December. It was 
above 163 even at the beginning of April. So I wouldn't play anything bearish on it because I think there's definitely some upside potential here. However, on a 180-day basis, I love the bullish play on this. I love the way that this sets up. It previously bounced off of 132 off the last earnings uh, back at the end of February. Uh, so there's definitely some precedent for some support at that level. And further, you see some more support right around this level as well. Uh, there's support right around here. Uh, you, you see one, two different levels of support. And I'm calling that out because level one of support, I get questions sometimes like, hey, how did you see that, uh, how did you see that support? We see a bounce off of it in uh, August of 2021. We see a bounce off of it in October of 2021. Uh, and then for this line right here, we see a bounce right here. We see a bounce-ish at this level. Uh, but I think two decently uh, outlined levels of support right there for us. So if I take these away and we can look purely at the, uh, remove the drawing, remove the drawing, look purely at that expected range again. I really like, despite the fact that, you know, I, I'm kind of 50-50 on Cadence Bank. I don't really have an opinion on it. I love the way that the bullish trade sets up, but let's go to the uh, one-year chart and make sure we're not completely leaving ourselves wide open on the downside, and it still doesn't really look like we are, right? That one-year low was 120-ish, and we saw something really similar with Microsoft. I think that's more of an overall market one-year low trend that we're looking at. Maybe three-year, yes, it gets a little scary because the pre-COVID highs, I mean, this is a very, very similar chart that we just looked at uh, on Microsoft, but yeah, you got pre-COVID highs at 82 uh, 132, I mean, with Microsoft, you might say, okay, you know, I'm fine holding that at 255 when even though it could go down to 180 at the pre-COVID highs. Cadence Bank is not necessarily one uh, that I may be willing to die on the same hill for. But let's look at, you know, let's look at that 130 level. Can you get 1% ROR? Uh, one thing to keep in mind is it's not a one-week trade, so we would maybe want to target 3 or 4% ROR. Uh, but you can get 2% ROR at 130. Not bad at all. And the good thing about these earnings trades is that if it goes up, you'll get that 2% in like a day. I mean, the, the premium on these will evaporate. Even though it's a month out, you know, being that far out of the money with earnings behind it, you'll get that premium very, very quickly. However, I'm just not in love with the idea of selling something 26 days out on something with this much kind of near-term downside, especially when you could definitely see a little bit further downside of the 120 level. I'm not like married to Cadence Bank or anything like that. And what I will always say from an advice perspective is if you are not in love with the trade, there's no need to place that trade. There's so many different stocks out there. There's so many different companies presenting earnings. We could just keep running through this process. But it is a good example. I think from a numbers perspective, it sets up very, very well. But again, we remember that our defense on the downside is potentially taking assignment on the stock, which is something I wasn't necessarily comfortable with. Now, if you don't want to have to sell a cash secured put, you don't want to be someone who's like, oh, I'm going to just take on the downside by taking assignment. The way that the numbers stack up for this one, a put credit spread is a very, very interesting scenario here. Because if that supreme downside is realized with a credit spread, it doesn't matter. You're covered on the downside. That's the point of the credit spread. So if we flip this to a vertical, maybe look at like a 120, 130 spread right here. 97 cent credit, that's a 10% return. That's not the worst thing in the world either. Uh, but it does take a decent bit of collateral and, you know, it's harder to close these out for max profit early as opposed to just a cash secured put. So still not entirely sold on that. But let's keep going day by day and see if we could find the most overvalued by day uh, and see if we could find anything we really like. And then that is how we will cap the stream off. So overvalued JetBlue for Tuesday. And when is JetBlue post? Uh, when are they reporting on Tuesday? Tuesday morning. So you'd have to sell these end of day on Monday. Uh, so Tuesday, you've got JetBlue. Let's take a look at JetBlue, J-B-L-U. And I haven't taken a sip of water here yet. I'm going to have to do it. I feel like I got something in my throat. So bear with me one second. That was fantastic. We are back. So JetBlue, let's flip this back to single. And again, we see this deviation between the market maker move and the uh, and the expected move. I might have to play around with my scanner a little bit uh, to see if there's anything we can throw together on here to find us kind of the biggest gaps in market maker move and expected move to find the most overpriced options in the market. But, you know, it's just another one of those little scanner rabbit holes you can go down. I think there's so many useful ways to use the scanners. And we have really just, even though we use a lot of them, we've got some bots set up based off of them. I really feel like we're only kind of scratching the surface. And as we get better at that, we'll get much better with, uh, you know, stock selection for our trades. 
But let's go to the table quick back in the uh, back in the spreadsheet. Type in JBLU. We've got 1287. We know that the ex uh, why do we want to chart here? Because there's a pretty big difference here. Let's chart the expected move here of a dollar seventy five. So 13% implied move right there from the options, but the 0.67 from the MMM says there's only going to be a 5.21% move. Interesting. So the MMM downside is going to be 12.2. And if we plot that on the chart, let's go over here. You know, JetBlue has been a very volatile stock. This is a three-year chart, though. And, you know, airlines went through a lot with, uh, with COVID. But the pre-COVID levels for JetBlue were higher than it is right now. So I'm not too worried about that kind of potential downside. I love this chart, quite honestly. Look at this. You've got what looks like 12-ish as bottom support. Top end of the range is 16. Between 12 and 16 over the last 180 days. It's a decently tight range for this kind of volatility. And if you go a year back, it's not the problem we ran into with Microsoft and the other stocks where they were even lower. It was even higher. So there's maybe even more upside for a bullish potential trade right here. Now, the big question is where can we get 1% ROR? And uh, we've got another one where it is a monthly option. And that may be the case where you see these big deviations uh, due to the monthlies. Now, hopefully we'll find some weeklies here. But yeah, I mean, you could sell the 1.76. Do we get any margin help on this? We get a lot of margin help on this. So you could maybe sell 10 of the 11 strike puts. I mean, I, I love the 12s even, you know, because you could sell the 12 strike put with 40 cents of premium that gets you down to an 1160 break even, which is right here right on the bottom end of the support uh, and that sets you up for protection all the way down to 1160 which is you know a dollar 20 which is a little bit under that expected move which is interesting we've got a ton of volume on the puts i don't know if there's anything special maybe being expected for these earnings uh, they got downgraded to hold which is i mean not the end of the world $16 price target, which again would suggest that 12 or 1160 basis is a fantastic place to be holding it at. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't hate what we're looking at right here with the, with the 12 striker and 11 strike. Now again, this might not be one I answer because I probably need to keep a little cash on the sidelines in case my current holdings take a dip. But I love the idea of like an 11 strike or a 12 strike right here, especially remembering the fact that with margin, this turns into like a 20% ROC. If you go with the 12 strike, you're getting $400 off 18 in collateral. That's still a 25 ROC. Uh, I mean, really, really solid value right there. I mean, I, I like either of those. And again, we're starting to see that these are a little bit helpful. And tracking these to say, okay, you know, is this approach we're taking going to work? Keep some notes on the trades you make, right? So for example, we have IV reversion trades. Our, our IV reversion trade, the only losing IV reversion trade on the year so far that was from ADGI. That was a biotech one. So I've made note of that. And we might say, hey, uh, we might want to avoid biotech stocks that are, you know, a few weeks from expiry in the future because we went on, on another one, ALVR, which is also currently sitting at a loss. So those kinds of notes are very, very useful because while the overall strategy, for example, we know IV reversion strategy historically is a very, very successful strategy. There may be little quirks uh, that you could use and identify and take notes on to eliminate or to eliminate, I guess, mistakes or make small improvements to the strategy. Because if you looked at our IV reversion trades and took out biotech, you'd probably have a higher win rate. And for example, if you looked at your earnings trades and then isolated just these super overvalued ones, maybe those in a bubble, uh, you know, perform better than the typical just earnings trades. Uh, and that is kind of how you use experience to find your advantages in the market. Again, Google's one that looks like it's overpriced. That's one that I'd be happy to own. Uh, let me let's, let's quickly look at Google. Uh, again, you got a one-year chart where this thing is just you know cratering downwards. You got a very very nice discount off of what it was sitting at after the last earnings, which were very very good at the beginning of February. Uh, but downside potential. Let's see what we've got from a three-year perspective. Another just you know tech stock that's just. These seem so propped up, and yes, it's it's so easy to say, but it's Google, you know, but it's Apple, but it's Microsoft. But you know, I feel like it's tough because you might get to the point where, you know, 
just because it's Google, Apple, or Microsoft doesn't mean that it's going to stay up here. And you might see some retraction uh, in valuation. If it gets back down to this level, that may be a lot more attractive. But if it gets down to something like a pre-COVID level, again, where we've seen a lot of stocks retrace to, you'd kind of be getting crushed by getting into these levels. But with that said, it is Google. Uh, implied volatility is high right now for earnings. RSI is low. That's a very, very good combo. Let's go to a one-year perspective, right? RSI is at 30. Implied volatility rank is 100. This is screaming for a long-term cash secured put. These are the exact setups we like to sell uh, when we sell those long-term cash secured puts. So maybe let's take a look at June. And I know this is for an earnings trade, but uh, you know, let's zoom. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. What can we get? Let's first look at the coming week for you know if you wanted to make a weekly earnings trade. Uh, 1% ROR at 2120. Where is 2120? Oh my God, that looks fantastic. That looks incredible. So if Google stays above this red line, you know, you make 1% ROR in a week, well, probably in a day, which is fantastic. And if it goes below that, you now own Google at a price lower than anyone who has bought Google in the last calendar year. Uh, I'm, oh man, I'm a big fan of that. What did they report? Let's, let's put Google on the list because these are technically overpriced according to this, uh, and they, prevent, uh, they present Tuesday after market. I am a fan of potentially making a Google earnings trade. Now, the flip side of this is, you know, the stock's trading at $2,400. Not everyone's going to be able to make this trade. I understand. Don't put more of your account in this than you need to. It's okay to say, you know what, I can't afford to take on a position that's, uh, that can't be right. Oh, that's JetBlue. I didn't even click on it. I can't afford to be taking on a position that's $210,000 fully cash secured. That makes sense. And to be honest, I can't afford to do that either. So I'm not going to. But if you are a you know high roller and you've got that kind of cash, this is a fantastic, uh, fantastic little setup right here. I would be a big fan of that. Uh, let's see. What, what's crazy to me is the fact that you could open a $210,000 position for only 21 k of buying power and you know, everyone's fine with that, but d different point right there. But if we wanted to finish the exercise, 184 uh, expected move right there, whereas 205 is what's priced in by the options. Again, that's in line with the idea that these are over overpriced. G-O-O-G-L. We know that expected move was 184 from an MMM perspective. Let's just throw 184 because I forgot the decimal on the end of it. Uh, 2208. And again, that 2208 level is right here. So you're selling outside the expected move. You've got a nice little gap between the low end of the expected move and your max profit point. But again, I'm not rich enough to sell Google 2,120 strike puts. Maybe one day, you know, five years from now, we're going to be all in on these, but uh, we just can't do that right now. But going back to these lists, because I think this has provided some really interesting stuff. Uh, we've got AR and EQT. I think AR is definitely the most overvalued right here. So let's look at AR. Do I know what AR is? Absolutely not. Never heard of it. But I think it's an interesting one to look at. There you go. This huge deviation again between expected move and market maker move where you have a market maker move of 225 and expected move of 533. And again, you've got a chart that looks a little scary from a one year perspective. So this probably is not one that I would like to get on because I mean, it's strange to me that a company would have a two or even a five dollar expected move on earnings after one it looks like it's dropped five dollars in the past week uh, and two it could potentially get all the way back down here but to the point it, it historically and a cool tab here that you can use to analyze this is if you click on earnings you type in ar it kind of does the work for you a little bit right historically it hasn't had these huge moves and you, it shows implied volatility versus historical volatility, right? So this is what we're seeing. There's a lot of implied volatility where historical volatility is much lower. And this gap right here is what we're looking for to determine if options are over or underpriced. Uh, for example, if we look at this chart, and I don't know what's going to happen here, but I assume this should be how this works. ATVI is undervalued, right? So on AR, where we know it's overvalued and we see this big gap where red is above yellow, I have a hunch that if I typed in ATVI, we would see yellow. Let's see. 
Well, I may have to run this one back. I may take this to the lab and try to figure out what to make of these, but it's a little bit different. Uh, but again, AR, there's still this big gap between implied volatility and historical volatility, suggesting that they're overpriced, but what scares me is just price movement here. Now, let's figure out what on earth AR is. It's an oil and gas company. So you've got factors, you know, much beyond earnings that are probably affecting this thing. This is, I mean, if you're making a quote unquote earnings trade on AR, I think what you're actually unintentionally making is a little bit more of a pure oil play as opposed to an earnings trade. And again, these expire 26 days from now. Uh, you can't even get 1% until down to 25, which is right around here. I would probably stay away from that one. Not a huge fan, even though they are technically overvalued. Uh, what was the other one we had on that? picture we had eqt which is not as severely overvalued but definitely worth a look uh same exact i mean this is i feel like i just pulled up the same exact chart what is eqt uh natural gas producer there you have it and that is why those numbers are different so let's keep moving uh, let's go to thursday and this gets into the window of when i really really like to play these trades because on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, yeah, you could sell options and you could be right for earnings, but that still leaves like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for post earnings stock moves. So I feel like there's a huge stock price movement risk when you sell earnings the front end of the week, which is why when I try to do earnings, I love the back end of the week. I thought Snapchat last week was awesome for selling earnings because it was Thursday afternoon. I think Thursday afternoon or Friday morning are the ideal uh, earnings trades because there is quite literally one day uh, for things to move against you because on the front end from an IV perspective you're going to get that crush no matter what because earnings are over uh, but from a theta decay perspective for the remainder of that extrinsic value that's going to decay in roughly eight trading hours as opposed to like four trading days so you've got two things working for you from a decay perspective which is fantastic for us as option sellers uh, but let's keep going here Thursday ATUS what do we got? And this thing has just had one hell of a year, it looks like. What's the three year looking like? Maybe a little bit better. I don't really know what's going on here with this one. But again, you probably, you don't really see that big of a gap, but it is saying that, you know, it's probably a little overpriced. Uh, and where can we get 1%? It looks like we can get 1% down at like, nine but again another one with may options only i don't know a ton about this one uh not one that i'd be willing to hold on to for a month you know with the whole conversation we just had about i love selling options on thursday because there's one day for one day until expiry not the case when you've got the monthlies uh so back to this chart yeah, nothing really thursday anything friday exxon mobile another oil play right there it looks like a lot of the oil ones are overvalued probably as a consequence of the current conditions in the oil market as opposed to actual, you know, earnings related volatility. That's uh, so nothing terribly groundbreaking here. I thought Google was interesting. Uh, and you know, there's some other stocks in these range. So feel free to pop into our discord server uh, and look through some of these and you can run through the process yourself. And I'm sure there are probably some interesting ones in there. And if you find anything, come back to the chat and share the good news and you know, further the idea of what we're trying to create to have, you know, be a community full of people and you know, I think that's one of the best selling points we have is we've got some really, really smart people in there. Uh, but just you know, to facilitate the information exchange as well and just get as many good ideas in there as possible. You know, because I'm only one guy. You know, when we put our heads together, I think we come up with some really, really good stuff in there. Uh, but I think that's everything from an earnings perspective. We'll maybe look a little bit more closely at some of these as we come up on the day, right? Because I really don't like to open earnings trades until right before. Uh, meaning that if you know Microsoft presents Tuesday after market close, meaning the market closes at 4 p.m., I wouldn't really want to open the trade until like 3.30 p.m. because I want pure earnings trades, right? I went on a little bit of the tangent about how if you play an earnings trade earlier in the week, there's a lot of time for the price to move against you. I want, in in the purest sense, I just want to be betting again, or I guess betting on price movement related to earnings and selling as close to market close as you can right before the event and then selling as late in the week as possible, you know, provided they are presenting late in the week, uh, I think is the way to accomplish that. Uh, but that's what we got. We'll definitely talk a little bit more about these in the Discord server as the week goes on because they're just some big, big names. Uh, and even if you're not playing them, you know, as an earnings trade, there's definitely implications for moves in the overall market. Uh, so that's something we'll definitely be keeping an eye on. 
Uh, but again, we're hitting the hour 30 mark. We're probably going to cut it off. If you are still on with us, uh, thanks for tuning in. If you are not part of HD Premium, I would love for you to join. We've got a great chat room full of people in here. Even though it's a weekend, it might be a little slow right now. But, uh, you know, it definitely is popping during the week. I think what I th maybe I've got a screenshot here. Yeah, you know, there's 15,000 messages in this one compared to, you know, some of the free channels are dying out a little bit, unfortunately, but still plenty of good activity going on. Go to Hourglass-Trader, uh, click on Join HD Premium, and you could sign up. But, uh, you know, back to the overall discussion of where we are in the market. Look, it sucks what this is never encouraging alone, but we always want to take a holistic long-term view on the market because we don't care about success for one day we don't care about success for one week or one month we care about long-term sustainable success so while yeah i do care that i lost money last week it sucks zoom out look at the big picture understand what we're doing and you know we're gonna get there eventually there may be some more short-term pain i'm not ruling that out but i know long term we are going to see the benefit of investing because you know in the long run the market will go up given a long enough time frame and if it doesn't you know, we've probably got some bigger problems on our hands, but this is what we've got. We have ourselves positioned to catch a bounce. Hopefully I'm talking to you guys again at the same time next week and, you know, our plan has worked. Hopefully this little bit of red that we see in futures right now uh, is nothing but a small bump in the road and we see a nice little rebound in the market because it's been one, two, three weeks in a row of really big red moves in the S&P 500, which is, you know, historically followed by a little bit of a bounce. So that's what we're playing. Uh, but for those of you who are still tuned in, thank you. We are going to be talking live on the Discord server all week. You know, there's only so much we could figure out on a Sunday night because things can change in the blink of an eye. We absolutely saw that last Thursday, last Friday. Uh, so keep posted there for more. But thank you for tuning in, signing off with the super cheesy. This has been Hourglass Trader, where as time passes, we make money and, uh, you know, hopefully we see you guys again same time next week with more money than we have right now. And we didn't stream last week, I think, because of Easter. And I didn't get to, you know, have that good luck sign off. So maybe I could blame our performance in the market on that. So, you know, now that I'm here, we, we've streamed this week. I've signed off with my cheesy sign off. You know, I think the odds are in our favor. So thank you guys for tuning in and we will see you next week, hopefully. Thanks, guys.